The Company of Wolves, a play for radio by Angela Carter, based on her own short story. With Elizabeth Proud as Red Riding Hood, Michael Williams as the werewolf, and Catherine Parr as Granny. The storyteller is John Westbrook. The Company of Wolves. Granny? Making some lucky little girl a present. What lucky little girl, Granny? <laughs> oh, Lord, love you, my darling. Who else would I be knitting a lovely woolly shawl for if it wasn't for Granny's own pet? Knit one, pearl one. A nice shawl to keep her snug so Granny's darling girl can wrap up warm and cosy trot through the wood to visit our old grandmother when the winter winds blow and we shall have snow. <laughs> Look what a nice red colour the wool is, eh? Red to match baby's rosy cheeks. Quite a bloody red. Quite bloody. Don't think of nasty things. Think of nice things. Cosy shawl for Granny's precious girl... Who's Granny's precious girl? I'm Granny's precious girl. And I chose a nice bright red because you need a bit of colour to cheer you up in winter. In the bleak midwinter. Knit one, pearl one. When the snow comes. It is a northern country. A late brief spring a cool summer, and then the cold sets in again. Cold, tempest, wild beasts in the forests, under the vaulted branches where it is always dark. When the snow comes, it precipitates in this inhospitable terrain a trance of being, an extended dream that lurches now and then into nightmare. The deer departed to the southern slopes, the cattle all locked up in the byre. Now is the time the wild beasts come out. Now is the savage time of the year. Nothing left for the wolves to eat. When the snow comes, red for danger when the wolves come. The wolves are running! Now is the season of the wolf, the low part of the year, when the sun has barely the strength to heave himself up over the horizon. In these days, the dire wolf travels in the crepuscular hours. Oh. I pull my pelt around me and go hunting. I can be grey as a cloud, or I can be tawny. At twilight, I roam to tear up the world with my huge claws. At twilight, I roam to devour the world with my cleaving teeth. At twilight, I travel with eyes in the back of my head. My howl deranges the soul. What shall we do, Granny? What shall we do? Shut the shutters. Fire the door. Throw more lugs on the fire. Make a great blaze. Keep the wolves outside. Fear and flee the wolf, my little one. There. Pearl one, knit two together. We are always in danger in the forest where no people are. Oh, my sweet grandchild. Whatever you do in the winter weather, never stray from the path through the forest, or... What will happen to me then, Granny? You'll be lost instantly, and the wolves will find you, and always be home by nightfall, or the wolves will... What will they do if they catch me? I... 
Gobble you up. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Stop it, Granny, you're tickling. After dark comes, they come. They cluster round the forest path. They track your smell of meat as you go through the wood, unwisely late. They are like wraiths, like shadows, grey members of a congregation of the damned, the beasts of blood and darkness, carnivore incarnate, the eternal predator, the perpetual hunger of the dark wood. That encompasses the lighted cottage in the clearing, the village, trustfully sheltering in the valley. But I'm not scared of anything. My daddy gave me a big knife. See? Don't I know how to use it? Didn't I see my daddy stick the pig? There's nothing in the wood can harm me. When it gets cold enough, the beasts grow impudent. Often I've jumped half out of my skin to see his cresting snout under the door, and there was a woman once bitten in our village in her own kitchen as she was straining the macaroni. Straining the macaroni. Bit in the foot. Pearl one, knit one. But the worst thing of all, my dearie, is some wolves are hairy on the inside. What? Like a sheepskin jacket. How can that be, Granny? When he be not a natural wolf, my dearie, no wolf at all. Knit two together. Near here, just up the valley, when my own Granny was alive, bless her soul, there was a wolf once in the winter time, come savaging the sheep and goats. Oh, such a terror as he was! What massacres he made among the flocks! And then this wolf got a taste for man flesh. It ate up a mad old man that used to live in a hut halfway up the mountain and sing to Jesus all day long, innocent as a lamb. Once a wolf's tasted human flesh, then nothing else will do. But when he digested the poor old man, just a few days after. The wolf pounced on a poor little girl. Couldn't resist her. She's so white, so tender. Little girl, just as old as you are. Twelve, going on thirteen. Thirteen, going on fourteen. Not such a little girl, for all that you baby me, Granny. Thirteen, going on fourteen. The hinge of your life. When you are neither one thing nor the other, nor child nor woman, some magic in between thing, an egg that holds its own future in it, an egg not yet cracked against the cup. I am the very magic space that I contain. I stand and move within an invisible pentacle, untouched, invincible, immaculate, like snow. Waiting, the clock inside me that will strike once a month, not yet wound up. I don't bleed. I can't bleed. I don't know the meaning of the word fear. Fear. Just your age, or a year or so older, and she was looking after the sheep on the high pasture. But she set up such a commotion help! Help the that the shepherds Wait, came running with their dogs help! and rifles. The but this help! old wolf was cunning and soon gave him the slip. Off into the woods he went. So what happened to the poor wolf then? Well, they sent to the town for a man whose trade was putting down such vermin. Famous for it he was. And this hunter dug a pit with steep sides, a deep pit, a wolf trap. 
And in this pit I stuck a sharpened stake and tied to this stake by a string around its left leg a fine... Now you just stop that flapping and hold still! It dearly grieved me, I can tell you, to give such a fat duck to the wolf when I could have roasted it up for myself. But there's no better bait in all the world for a wolf than a duck. So I popped it down the pit, and then I covered the pit with branches and settled down in the undergrowth. Downwind, so he couldn't get a sniff of me, and bided my time. Here he comes. What a size! Near as big as I am. And how his eyes do shine. And into the trap went the silly wolf. And stuck himself directly on that pointed stake. So I jumps down and slits his throat quick as a wink and commenced to lop off his paws. For I had a fancy to mount this brute's great pads, you see, to decorate my mantle, along with the boar's head and the moose head and the great carp my uncle caught ten winters ago that he'd stuffed. But only the one paw did I chop off, because so help me as I stand here. Mother Mary and all the saints in heaven protect me. Upon the ground, the hunters saw there fall no paw at all, but... A hand. A man's hand. The desperate claws retract, refine themselves, as if attacked by an invisible emery board, until suddenly they become fingernails, and could never have been anything but fingernails, or so it would seem. The leather pads soften and shrink until you could take fingerprints from them, until they have turned into fingertips. The club tendons stretch, the foreshortened phalanges extend and flesh out. The bristling hair sinks backwards into the skin without leaving a trace of stubble behind it. Now my skin is the same kind of skin as your skin, little sister. There, my hand. Won't you take hold of my hand? See? It's just the same as any other hand, only perhaps a little larger. Didn't you see the enormous prints I left in the snow? Once, one winter when I was little, my father took me out into the wood, and we found the track of a wolf, prints as big as dinner plates, and my father took a good grip of his rifle and peered around. But I put my little foot into the print to match it for size. And I felt all the warmth that lies under the snow swallow me up. And now no wolf at all lay before the hunter but the bloody trunk of... So may I never touch another drop. It was a man with his throat cut and handless, bleeding, dying, dead. But I would be sorry for the poor thing, whatever it was. Man or beast, or some benighted twixt and tween thing. Trapped by a mean trick and finished off without its supper. Knit two together. And worse than that has happened with these vile, unnatural creatures. When I was a young thing, about your age, there was a woman in our village married a man who vanished clean away on his wedding night. They made up the bed with new sheets and laid the bride down on it and left them alone together. But then the groom said... (laughs) But, uh, first of all, before I do join you between covers, it just so happens, my bonnie, how I must slip outside to answer the call of nature. Why can't he piss in the pot provided, my love? What, on our wedding night, my dear? In the name of decency. So she waited... Oh, and didn't he look a lovely man as he stood there in front of the altar and I come down the aisle in my white frock and he turned his head a bit round to see me. Oh, a lovely man. Even if his eyebrows meet and he'd be altogether on the hairy side 
And she waited. On the first, if he be a boy, we shall call after his daddy. But if she be a girl, why we'll name her for me, ma'am. And she waited some more. Until she thinks. Surely he's been gone a long time. God save us all! That long-drawn, wavering howl that has, for all its fearful resonances, some inherent sadness in it, as if the beasts would love to be less beastly, if only they knew how, and never cease in some wordless, devastating sense to mourn their own condition. There is a vast melancholy in the canticles of the wolves, melancholy infinite as the forest, endless as those long nights of winter. And yet that ghastly sadness, that mourning for their own irremediable appetites, can never move the heart, for not one phrase in it hints at the possibility of redemption. Grace could not come to the wolf from its own despair, only through some external mediator. When the rumpus died down a bit, and I judged it safe to venture into the farmyard, I got down the lantern and searched among the outhouses all in my nightie as I was, and that distressed. Oh, weeping and wailing I was to think the wolves had eaten up my bridegroom and left nothing behind to bury. For not a gnawed bone, nor hank of hair even, nor yet a rag of his wedding suit did I find. But in the snow, many huge paw prints, as if the beastly things had been having themselves a bit of a dance. A dance! <laughs> So, then I reckons how he's good and done for. So I dried my eyes and went out and found myself another husband not too shy to piss under his own roof. And the first boy we named for his father. But he would insist the girl be called after me. My bouncing babies, merry as grigs. First they crawl, then they toddle, then they walk. Then they run. Years after, oh, years after, it was one winter's night, one freezing night when the moonlight looks like it could cut you. My husband out in the byre tending the cattle, myself in the kitchen with the bairns. I just laid in the soup, just before Christmas it was, when night time lasts longer than daytime. It is the season of the solstice, the hinge of the year the time when things don't fit well together, when the door of the year is sufficiently ajar to let all kinds of beings that have no proper place in the world slip through. One snowy, moony night, her first good man came home again. He hadn't forgotten her then. He came home for Christmas. Lift up the latch and let me in. <gasps> I knew him the minute I laid eyes on him, though now he was in rags, and his hair grown so, not seen a comb for years, down to his backside, alive with lice, and hellfire, yes, hellfire darting in his look. Here I am again, missus. Fetch me my bowl of cabbage and be quick about it. There's changes made in this house, you villain. You've been away too long to have a claim on me. Mama! Who's this wee tender morsel? Mama! You just stay away from him. Come to Mama. What's this? Cubs? Has this wench been playing among the blankets while her lawful wedded husband's out the way? You bastard. You Bible. Mama! Mama! Save us! Don't you dare lay a finger. I wish I were a wolf again to teach this whore a lesson. And then, he flinging off his coat, his shirt, his boots, his trousers... A wolf, he instantly became. But my rightful husband, hearing this commotion, and hastening in, 
Seize the axe we used to chop up firewood. That's fixed him. So, the father of my children made an end of my visitor. Then and there. Such a mess he made. Blood and guts all over the kitchen floor. With one blow struck off its head. And the torso twitched a bit. But then... Mama, it's fur. It's fur so melting away. And indeed, its hairy pelt fell off like snow off a roof in February when the thaw comes. And you could see how he was nothing but an ordinary man underneath. And the years since I'd last seen him had scarcely touched him. And his head, that had rolled onto the hearth and come to rest just by the kettle. The furry head with the sharp ears and brindled muzzle and dreadful crushing jaw. Why, then it turned back into his head. And there was my old sweetheart's face, with that self-same smile on it that he'd given me long ago when we were young. When I walked down the aisle towards him, me in my white lace dress, and he turned round to look at me, giving me a bit of a smile as if to say, Courage, lass. And I never did care that his eyebrows met. So now I couldn't forbear to... <laughs> Is this the thanks I get for butchering the beast? You harlot, I'll fairly larrup you, I will. Take that! Knit <laughs> two together. Now... I'm just ready to cast off. See how it's done? Then your shawl will be ready to slip round your little shoulders. How? How? Do they let their insides come outside? It is the devil's reward for long service. For they do say there is a salve the devil gives him, hands it out at the Sabbath. Fat of a cat, camphor, aniseed, opium, all mixed together, rubbed well into the skin. Or they do sup a drink the devil makes. An infusion of mandrake, belladonna, henbane, taken in a glass of wine. Or else they drink from a stream the devil shows them and go ravening off. Or sip the rainwater out of a wolf's paw print that is the size of a basin. And some are born so. Those that come into the world feed first on St. John's Eve and have a wolf for a father. And his torso will be a man's. But his legs... His privates, those of a wolf. And he will have a wolf's heart. A wolf's heart? But before he can turn into a werewolf, he must always strip stark naked, peel off all his human concealments down to the bald, natural buff. If you spy a naked man among the pines, my dearie, you must run as if the devil were after you. A naked man? In this weather? He'd have his thingamajigs frozen off, Granny. <laughs> well, just you watch out. Just you watch out. I must and will go to Granny's house today. I've set my mind upon it. Then don't leave the path through the woods. I've got the big red shawl my Granny knitted me. That'll keep me warm. And my mother is packing a basket. Oat cakes, butter, cheese. Full of good things for the poor old lady. A little pot of bramble jelly. Oh, you spoilt one. Oh, you willful one. But if off you must go on such a cold winter's day, the shortest day of all the year, then be sure to keep to the path through the wood and don't stay out after nightfall. Or else the wolves will gobble me up. <laughs> if your daddy were here, he'd never let you. But he's out in the forest picking up sticks. <sighs> she being the youngest, and yes, the prettiest, our little bud, our blossom, I can deny her nothing. And she, she's such a high opinion of herself, she thinks the snow will forbear to fall upon her. And here I've got my daddy's knife. Don't I know how to stick the pigs with it? I will and shall go to Granny's house today. I'll just slip a bottle of ardent spirits into your basket to keep the old lady's bones warm. 
and don't stray off the path for a minute and don't let the sun go down with you still outdoors. If it was summer, I should pick the flowers and chase the butterflies. But now it is winter, only last night's snow on the bare boughs. No reason to dawdle. How my breath smokes. Well, here's the robin, the friend of man in his bloody waistcoat, perched on a stump to wish me good morning. And if I walk as quiet as I can, then I may spy Reynard the fox taking home a hen out of my daddy's run so his family can have some dinner. A raven. Why Reynard the fox has been out early this morning, here's the blood of some poor slaughtered bunny on the snow. The horrid raven pecking it. Shoo, you cannibal, shoo! Oh, please, young lady, put away that knife. How fierce you look. I never intended to startle you. I would have thought there was nobody in all the wood but me. Well, well, well. Who's this fine young man sprung out of nowhere? If you spy a naked man in the forest, run as if the devil were after you. But this one's got all his clothes on, Granny. Such nice clothes, too. Lovely bit of tweed, that jacket with the leather patches on the elbows. And a felt hat with a feather in the band. And nice whipcord breeches and such a shine on his leather boots. It took a gentleman's gentleman to give this gentleman's boots that shine. Out after game. He must be out after game. Doesn't he have his rifle over his shoulder? Here I am, a jolly huntsman. So he makes me a little bow, polite as can be, and... Allow me. What lovely manners! Taking the heavy old basket off me to carry himself. Not like those rude clowns in the village who don't know how to treat a lady, let a girl hump the potato sacks all by herself. <gasps> my knife. I put my knife in the basket. My rifle will protect us both, young lady. You have nothing to fear when you're with me. Permit me. So, this fine young gentleman takes my arm, and off we go together as if we were out for a ramble, and soon we're chattering away together as if we'd sucked on the same nipple. <laughs> Taking a few bits of this and that to my old granny, sir, seeing as she is bedridden. Parted company with my friends in order to bang away by myself, and now I'm making for the village. Make haste and speed, for the day darkens early this time of year. Hoping to find some friendly hostelry, a bite to eat, to drink. Should you escort me as far as my granny's house, sir, I'm sure my granny would gladly give you a cup of tea. Or maybe something a bit stronger, seeing as how we slipped a bottle of brandy in with the butter and cheese. Delighted! Delighted! And me, all of a flutter. Poor simple girl that I am, for he is such a handsome young fellow, for all his eyebrows do grow close together. Fifteen, going on sixteen, the tenderest age. Under that red shawl, how white her skin must be, as white as breast of chicken, succulent as loin of pork. Little miss, pretty miss. See what I have in my pocket. Now, this young man had the most remarkable object in his pocket, which he brought forth to show to me. At first I thought it was perhaps some kind of a pocket watch, for it was round and swung on a chain. But tick, it did not. And then it came to me how it might be a locket with a picture of his sweetheart inside, which made me squint a bit until he said... This is what we call a compass. It had a round face, much like a clock, but no numbers on it and only the one hand that moved around in a wavering manner, wavering as if it were looking for something. Looking for the north. And he told me how this compass had helped him find his way through the trackless forest, because the needle always pointed to the north with perfect accuracy. So you see, I can never lose my way. I'm always at home in the forest. But I did not believe him. I knew I should never leave the way on the path through the wood. 
or else I should be lost instantly. <laughs> Why, I can guarantee you, if I plunge off this winding path directly into the wood now, at this moment, and find my way by the compass, I will arrive at your grandmother's house a good quarter of an hour before you do, I promise you. I shan't leave the path. I won't leave the path. Then you stay on the path, and I'll go through the wood, and we'll see who gets to your granny's house first. Is it a wager? Shall we make a little bet on it? You get there how you like. I'll get there how I like. What will you give me if I get there before you? What would you like me to give you? A kiss. Oh, she's blushing. Like blood leaking into snow. Look how dark it's getting. Oh, why, I do believe we shall have snow. A kiss? <laughs> You're on. Uh, here, hold on. You've taken my basket with you. And my knife, you've taken my knife. Oh, never mind it. I'll soon catch up with him. <laughs> what an adventure, though. Indeed. For fear of catching up with him too soon. I'll take my time, I will, over this last half mile to Granny's house. Although the snow is coming on. Towards the fringes of the forest, nestling in a clearing, a cottage whose ruddy windows beamed with cheerful light as if in the approaching dark and the whirling beginnings of the snow, that house contained all the human warmth in the world. Towards the cottage door, the huntsman now purposefully directed his footsteps. Who's that knocking on my door? Early old granddaughter! Come all this way to see you on a cold and snowy evening! By his incandescent eyes, she knew at once the nature of her visitor, and clasping her hands together, she besought... Is you Joseph Mary St. Anne, St. Elizabeth, St. Call on all the saints of the calendar to speed hot foot from heaven to help you, Granny, but it won't do you any good. How can you keep the night out when it wants so much to come in? Before he can become a wolf, the werewolf strips stark naked. Good. To get out of these silly clothes. Under his clothes, he was the colour of goat cheese, and nipples black as poison berries, and a stripe of hair running down his belly, and so thin he was that you could count his ribs. Ah, but I'm not going to give you any time. <laughs> and now, as the old lady quivered with dread before him, she witnessed the unimaginable metamorphosis. The coarse, grey... The tawny, bristling pelt springing out from the bare skin of her visitor. The great jaw slavering, his red eyes now burning with far greater intensity than the coals in her hearth. And his privates of a wolf, huge, he naked as a stone, but hairy, he... Old bird indeed. Veritable jaw cracker. Mm, not much meat on her. All sinew. Still waste not, want not. Down the red lane with granny. Mm. And isn't dessert trotting through the woods towards me this minute? Mm. She tender as a peach. Juicy as a wood strawberry. Mm. When he had finished with her, he quickly dressed himself again until he was just as he had been when he came through the door. He burned the inedible hair in the fireplace and wrapped up the bones in the tablecloth. What, Granny? Shaking your old bones at me? Playing a tune on your own xylophone? I'll put you under the bed out of harm's way. 
Don't you know I've done for you, Granny? Oops. Here's my rifle. Hmm. Best hide it up the chimney. Lest dessert takes a mind to shoot it off at me. You... Why? Here's a basket. Oatcakes, butter, cheese. Uh, nothing fit for a carnivore to eat. Hello. Brandy. How about a little digestive, Granny? Here's to your posthumous health. Now, settle down in Granny's chair. Best put on the old lady's nightcap. Don't want to scare away the little pretty if she peeks through the window to see if her handsome huntsman got here before her. <laughs> Where can she have got to? Who's that knocking on my door? Didn't the young gentleman get here before me, Granny? A young gentleman? What young gentleman? I see no young gentleman. Lift up the latch and come in like a dutiful granddaughter. And then, oh then, how I did want the big knife my father gave me to do for him. Oh, yes, I did. But as for my knife, I could not get it. It being in my basket, my basket being on the table, and him standing between me and the table. Tall and wild, as if all the wild wood was made into a man. And it come into the kitchen, and his eyes as big as saucers, flaming... Big eyes you have. All the better to see you with, my pretty. You're a sight worth looking at. And there was no trace of my granny anywhere in the kitchen, but for a tuft of white hair caught in an unburned bit of log in the grate. And then I knew I was in danger of death. What have you done with my granny? There's nobody here but we too, darling. Then fear of death came over me, I who had been afraid of nothing. For though I knew that he had just eaten... Yet I know the wolf is always hungry. And I cannot cry for help because we are a good mile from the village. Yet, though I am among the wild beasts, I must not be afraid. Because fear is their meat. So I must not suffer it. Who has come to sing to us? Those are the voices of my brothers, darling. I love the company of wolves. Look out of the window and you'll see them. How it's snowing. You can't see through the lattice, the pane all caked with snow. Open the window. And on the branches of the apple tree outside my granny's window were perched a fruit of wolves. It had become a wolf tree. They all staring at me with their big dumb eyes. Eyes with such sorrow in the pupils. Ten wolves, twenty wolves, more wolves than I could count. Eyes catching the light from the kitchen and shining like candles. Each beast pointing its muzzle to the moon and howling, fit to break your heart. It's freezing cold, poor things. No wonder they howl so. Are you cold too, my darling? Would you like a glass of brandy to warm you? Oh, it's warm enough indoors by the fire. Then take off your shawl. What shall I do with it now? Burn it, dear one. You won't need it again. So I stuffed the shawl in the fireplace, and seeing the bottle of brandy my mam gave me to give Granny, I doused the fire with it to make the flames jump up. <laughs> the light! My eyes! And up the chimney went the red shawl that my granny knitted me, it catching fire on the way. Whoosh! Look! Like a bird with flamey wings. <laughs> and just as if my granny were angry with me for setting light to her shawl, there came such a rattling of her old bones. Well, I do think tonight, on such a night, that I should wear nothing but my skin. For why should I go clothed when the poor wolves outside do not? Skirt, my blouse, 
One stocking. Two stockings. On to the fire. What a blaze. Oh, hush and be quiet, Granny, while your granddaughter entertains your visitor. There. See? All my clothes burned up. Oh, sir, your eyes, they're watering. Are you in pain? Can't you bear the bright light? <laughs> my eyes. Oh, sir, don't turn your head away. Not from a poor girl like me. Or is it the firelight has got into my skin, too? Do I blaze, sir? Am I too bright for you, sir? I can't. I can't. What is it, sir? Is it that you're having some difficulty about turning into a wolf, sir, because I've had my clothes off first? Is that it? Aren't you frightened of the wolf? Since my fear did me no good, I put it away from me, sir. Put it away with my clothes. Oh, fine gentleman. Fair is fair. If I am to go naked, then you must go naked too. Let me unbutton that shirt for you. D don't struggle now. What does my mummy say? Let's skin the rabbit. But this rabbit has fur underneath his skin. What big arms you have. There. Put them around me. There. I do believe, since you got here before me, that you owe me a kiss. All the better to eat you with. Oh, oh I say. <laughs> well, each to his meat. But I am meat for no man. Now, I shall burn your clothes just like I burn my own. Not that. Why? Anybody would think you were scared of being a good wolf all the time. <sighs> and now I shall see you as the good wolf you are. The honest wolf. The kind wolf. For to their own, the wolves are tender, are they not? If you were truly a wolf, would you not let me climb up on your back and take me home through the forest? Outside's not the place to be tonight. The snow, the freezing blast. Stay indoors with me. Lie down on Granny's bed. What? Make ourselves cozy? There we are. Lay your head in my lap. There. Your great grey grizzled head. Let me scratch your lovely ears. You can hear the clouds move, can't you? You can hear the grass grow, such sensitive ears, so quick of hearing. And I can see the lice move on your fur, poor beast. <laughs> and shall I pick the lice out? Would that be a kindness to you? <laughs> Midnight. The blizzard will die down. The door of the solstice stands by wide open. Mm. She's drowsy. She's sleepy. Oh, how soft your fur is. Warm. When I was a man, I heard a story that then I did not believe because I thought that all wolves were as I was. How there was a woman lived on the mountain, and she went into labor in winter in a storm and bore her little daughter and died of it. Nobody by her but her husband. He did what he could, but when there was no hope for her, he went off to the village to fetch the priest, the snow falling, the wind blowing, and the ice on the river broke under him. He drowned. 
When the storm passed off, this woman's mother went out to see after her and found a corpse, but no baby, not a trace. So they all thought the wolves had eaten her. And seven years went by until another hard winter when the wolves came out of the forest after the goats and the dead woman's mother saw a creature with long hair that might have been a little girl and she running with them. And they found footprints among the paw prints. Footprints. So they scoured the mountain and found the child in a cave with an old grey wolf they shot when it jumped up at them. Then they took the girl back to the village and locked her in a barn, but she howled, how she howled. She howled until she brought every wolf out from all over the forest, dozens of them, hundreds of them, howling in concert as if demented. And the wolves laid siege to the barn and would let nobody near, and the girl ran away with them. And seven years later, the old woman, she was out gathering mushrooms. She saw a grown woman with two pups kneeling by the river, lapping up water. But when the old woman called out, My dear one, my pet, come back to me. Off the other one ran to where her friends were waiting. Are you listening? Are you sleeping? The blizzard died down, leaving the woods as randomly covered with snow as if a clumsy cook had knocked the flower bin over them. Moonlight, snow light, a confusion of paw prints under the apple tree outside the window. All silent, all still. She's sleeping. Look, her paws twitch. She's dreaming of rabbits. Sweet and sound, she sleeps in Granny's bed between the paws of the tender wolf. In The Company of Wolves by Angela Carter, Elizabeth Proud played Red Riding Hood, Michael Williams, The Werewolf, and Catherine Parr, Granny. Other parts were played by Peter Baldwin, Eve Karpf, Elizabeth Ryder, Jeremy Booker, and Emma Kate Davis. The storyteller was John Westbrook. The play was directed by Glyn Dearman.